Welcome back to the channel, my name is Brahim. I'm going to read this about what Michael Burry has been going through. So, Michael Burry, if you don't know him, he's the guy that predicted the housing market uh, crisis in 08, 09. And, well, Michael Burry has been through a lot of stuff. He's posted 20 things on Twitter in the past. He's literally had to take off his tweets at one point. Then he had some sort of investigation from the SEC. So... This guy knows so much, but the difference is now you've got social media, you can put your opinions out there, but before he didn't really do that. But now he's given us some information, and this is one post. It's a little bit old, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. Michael Burry handed us the missing piece on a silver plate, how financial institutions are using US Treasury securities nearly caused the market to collapse, and what does it mean for us? All right, so it took a long time to write and was thanks to Michael Burry linking this in his profile. They're mysteriously moving it less than a day later. This post will have a lot of parallels to the everything short. However, it was, sorry, however, it's closer to the debunking post and goes into much more depth as it's necessary to understand the full picture when we start the analyst, when we start to analyze the link Michael Burry provided. All right, then hold on for a big read you feel educated as fuck after reading this. User Atobit did an amazing job turning his DD into a monkey speak. Let's get a better understanding of the concepts first. No, I do not agree with the hypothesis drawn in the everything, everything short, if that's not clear already. What the fuck is a repo and reverse repo? So, sell US Treasury securities, the repo goes to the repo, part. it goes to the repo buyer, reverse purchase agreement, Provides repo seller with 100 million in overnight funds and then it goes to the repo seller repurchase agreement and you can see this little circle but halfway through you got provides repo seller with 100 million in overnight funds buys back US Treasury securities it goes to the repo seller repo seller pays 100 million plus interest so 100 million times repo interest rate times the number they borrowed out of 360 back to repo buy and you can see it's just like a kitchen circle um the visual the visual this visualization is saying that repos and reverse are the same transactions but titled differently based on which side of the transaction you're on if you're originally selling a security and agreeing to repurchase in the future this is a repurchase agreement repo on the flip side for the party originally buying the security and agreeing to sell in the future it's a reverse purchase agreement reverse repo the key thing here is that we need to understand is how the Federal Reserve uses repo and reverse repo agreements. This is important, please pay attention. How the Federal Reserve uses repo slash reverse repos. In the US, repo and reverse repo agreements are the most commonly used instruments of open market operations for the Federal Reserve. As the user puts, the Fed Reserve goes brrr, well, the Fed Reserve, the Fed goes brrr. To put this into reverse ape talk, they are boosting the overall money supply by buying back treasury bonds or other government debt instruments. This infuses the banks with cash and increases its cash reserves in the short term. The Fed then will then resell the securities back to the bank. In summary, when the Fed wants to tighten the money supply, they can simply remove money from the cash flow using repos, selling bonds back to the banks. They want to go brrr and increase the supply. Using a reverse repo later to buy back the bonds returning money into the system. Great, we have found the foundational understanding of how liquidity, of how liquidity works through the use of repos and reverse repos. The next thing we need to understand, the financial panic that hit before the GFC in September 2008. Why is this different to the spikes we have been seeing in repo rates since 2019? How this relates to Michael Burry updating his Twitter profile link this and then removing it the day later for his profile. So you got his profile, as you can see, Michael J. Burry, and you know it's official because you can go check it plus the amount of followers. It's not fake. The crisis that led to a crisis. Many people may be surprised to learn, but there was a financial panic that occurred just before the GFC in 2008, and that was the bailout of Bear Stearns in March 2008. The story started a little earlier than this in 2007-08. This financial panic of the period stemmed from our beloved repo market. In some, in some analysis done by NBER, 
They argue that security is created from loans that originated in the now famous subprime mortgage market played a major role in inciting this panic. But this is ultimately the loss of liquidity at the firms that they were the biggest players that led to the financial crisis. To summarise their words without going into details listed here, housing market started to weaken early, 20, early 2007. Repo market, which was made up of security bonds, often made up of mortgages, repo market buyers then started having a mini freak out, worrying about the quality of the securitized assets in the bonds. Repo market buyers also started to have a mini freak out about haircuts increasing, difference between the deposits and the value of the asset in a repo. The deposits is generally lower. Banks would then raise capital by issuing new securities didn't work thanks to real estate continuing to slump. Got made worse by forced selling of underlying collateral which, turned, which then turned into a cycle of declining assets values increasing these haircuts further. This leads us to the most important point. Due to the cycle above, lenders were saying fuck no to providing short term financial and repo haircuts jumped further which is in equal part the equivalent of saying massive withdrawals from the banking system. Cough, fractional reserve banking cough. So what does this imply? This sequence of events fucked with the securitized banking cycle, which to everyone dismay needs to run without interruption. Monkey speak. If you get a kink somewhere along a hose, water liquidity drives up. I'll stop here. But TLDR for the rest of the story is that the kink becomes a knot and a contagion spreads further to other securities, eventually resulting in Bear Stearns being rescued and later the collapse of Lehman Brothers and some big bailouts. GFC of 2008. Note, in this post describes Lehman Brothers' relationship with the repo agreements, this whole chapter is discussing the crisis which caused the crisis. The main point to take away out of all this is how reliant the system was slash is on liquidity back in the back in pre GFC times. How has this changed? Let's find out. Fuck your efficient market hypothesis. Thanks to the user of the screenshots, the below is more in depth explanation of what the user went into, which will provide important context for later. So here's a little graph. Um, you got the run on repo described in the chapter above and then on the right you have US overnight repo rate and you can see over the quarters it soared, Q1 spiked, Q4 spiked. There was a great case study done on this and I value it thanks to the in value quotes from market participants. For a more dry read, head over to the Federal Reserve link. However, what went wrong? Pretty obvious here, repo rate spiking 6.5% then again to 10% a year later. As you likely know, this is absurdly high. We can expect some volatility at key quarter or year end reporting periods, but holy wow, this is not, not this level of volatility. Why did repo rates spike? The main reason is thanks to the Federal Reserve doing themselves a dirty. They introduced a bunch of regulations after the GFC to they can make sure they like this would not happen again. In late 2017, they started scaling down in quantitative easing. Remember how we talked about fractional reserve banking? This is where it rears its ugly little head again, but in a different manner. Us apes get paychecks. We dump our paychecks into the bank accounts to facilitate things like rent, mortgage payments, food, etc. This is the same case for the banks, except their deposits are chilling with the Fed in a special bank account known as bank reserves. These bank reserves have requirements on how much money is required at a minimum to be sitting in there. This is the minimum reserve requirement and anything they hold on top of there is excess reserves. There's a bunch of economic implications these reserves have, but the thing we want to focus on is the quantitative easing program implemented after 2008 GFC in relation to increasing the amount of excess reserves in the banking system. The side effect of this type of program means a bank excess reserves are not really excess anymore as they need to be increased to meet regulatory constraints. This is the main reason why we saw spikes in the repo rate in the above chart. Hop on kids, let's go back to pre-GFC times. Another way to look at the repo rate is from a demand perspective. Naturally, you expect a rate to increase as supply remains the same, but the demand increases. Back in pre-GFC times when the demand when the de 
When this demand for funding increases in the repo market, banks with excess reserves can quickly increase their lending capacity to take advantage of higher rates. They use their excess reserves to increase the supply, which, mean, which means they can essentially get a grip on the rate to smooth it out. Data time, back to the recent past. Now moving forward in time to a recent past, we post GFC and there are new rules for the banks. They need to start holding a minimum amount of high quality liquid assets on their balance sheets. Bonds classify as high quality liquid assets, but the excess reserves are more efficient. In this image below, we have two charts. The top chart showing total reserves, which is excess reserves, are components of this and the bottom shown our overnight repo rate we're all familiar with. The Fed starts scaling back quantitative easing in late 2017. They stopped buying bonds from the banks. This meant the Fed stopped crediting the bank's excess reserves, the slow reduction in total reserves in the top chart. Reduction in supply, reserves dropping from, and then means repo rates start to increase. Demand for repo funding increased in September, but due to frictions like high quality liquid assets, it's prevented banks from smoothing out the rate. Boom! Overnight repo rates back to 10% in late 2019. And you can see on this chart, literally going from 2 to 10%, which is a, a major increase. And you can see this is where the Fed starts scaling back away from quantitative easing from 2016, staying away. And yeah. Everyone and their mothers at the Fed would have shit themselves that day. The funny thing is that JP Morgan CEO said that they could have prevented this from happening, but they were stopped thanks to regulations such as high quality liquid assets. So what does the Fed decide to do next? The Fed goes Brrr. The effective federal fund rates below is that the rate at which commercial banks can borrow and lend excess reserves to each other overnight. So Fed goes Brrr. reserves go Brrr. And you can see this is the lending and this is the borrowing or vice versa. To delve into a little deeper why high reserves means a more stable rate, what we're really saying is the banks can turn a profit from pricing inefficiencies in the market if they do not have high quality liquid assets, restrictions as on, for example, they may have been able to shift assets around on their balance sheets when they see the repo rate start to creep higher to make a nice dime off it. This is very much how the world work pre-GFC and you can see the Fed have essentially created a kink in the hose themselves which caused the volatility thanks to liquidity issues once more. So that essentially a long-winded explanation of the user or at a bit post that goes into a bit more detail and has a focus on the liquidity aspect. I also end this section with the following. Liquidity, like the plumbing in your house, gets a little attention until something goes wrong. Which is fairly true. Federal reserves in response to COVID dropped reserves requirements to 0%. It was after they changed this rule they decided to drop Fed rates, thanks COVID, which caused the above reserves to further skyrocket as they inject $500 billion into the repo market their last lever essentially, collateral chains. All right, back to Michael Barry. He put a link in his profile for about a day, maybe less than removed it again. Yeah, you've already said that. Why did he link it and why did he link this and what was in it? Why is the timing so convenient? A lot of what's discussed is the linked Federal Reserve notes and scarily similar to what the user was touching on. It's all about the circulation of collateral, so let's dig in. Collateral. We've got an intro to this above in regards to repos. It refers to an asset that a lender accepts on security for a loan. Collateral can be really handy. It can be used quickly to raise funds or things like satisfying margin requirements, but they can also be reused, e.g. a hedge fund gives securities as collateral to the broker and then the broker can use this collateral sources securities in order to sell them short in winky face. Collateral chains. Collateral reuse sounds shady as fuck. I hear you say. Well, yes, all this free circulation of collateral comes at a cost of increasing interconnectedness and contributes 
to the fragility in financial markets by increasing the confusion about who the fuck holds the collateral and who the fuck returns it. This is our collateral chain that referred to in the paper and it propagates uncertainty and amplifies fragility in times of market stress. Uh, this still makes sense, but everyone in the industry is likely behaving similar to this. Repo agreements highlighted in 2018. Securities purchased un under agreements to resell. As you can see, you are, this is in the thousands, by the way. So 5.1 billion as of December 31st, 2018. Repo agreements highlighted in 2019 at 7.7 .7 billion dollars. Repo agreements highlighted in 2020, 16 billion dollars. Financial institutions are dynamic. Now this is a bit of a new speculation that you've not heard of in the user's post. And I believe is what Michael Burry has been attempting to communicate to us. Why did we see an increase every year in repo and reverse repo agreements? Why did 2020 see a greater than 100% increase? I'm speculating that this is to do with quantitative. I'm speculating that this is to do with quantitative easing being lifted, and then the major reversal of the Fed in 2020 to drop rates due to what we saw in 2019. After all, when they see a new opportunity, they got a jump on it. Can't be relying on outdated practices. Why did we see an increase every year in repo and reverse repo agreements? Let's go back to 2008. The Federal Reserve is increasing and financial institutions are taking out more risk. We also see the overnight repo rates increasing in line as a correlation, which makes sense. However, what caused the bubble to pop back then and QE and other measures to take place is different to our recent past. They at least still had liquidity in the repo market up until the kink in the hose formed. Um, here you go, you got a chart, you got blue, which is resell repos in thousands. They got a repurchase of reverse repos in thousands. So you can see it's like 7 billion from 2006. When the crisis happened in 2008, this is when it's at its lowest point. Then you can see it spiked up 2010, 2012 dropped spiked up to 10 billion spiked down to 2015 then since 2015 that was the lowest point it's been for over this like 14 year chart except for 2012 for 2015 it's just gone up and now we're at like 17 billion as of 2020 note the blue and red line are extremely close to each other which is why you don't see the repo series in the chart easily i had to zoom in there generally is a blue line you just don't see it unless you zoom in my bad what this chart is showing us is that the Palofax has sporadically utilized the repo market before when the Fed rates were low 2008 to 2017. When the Fed started to lift quantitative easing in 2017, we see some breaks being applied to use their repo market and showing growth for the most part of year on year since 2015. Soon before it explodes in 2020 when Fed rates dropped to close to 0% again. Based on Fed rates dropping, it's not surprising and it's likely an industry trend, not just isolated to Palo facts. Speculative away apes, why? Because they are greedy and have been reusing collateral to create collateral chains as they make some decent cash off the leverage they receive in return. Why did 2020 see a greater than 100% return? So we've got a little conversation here. Person A, hey, you see the Fed dropped rates? Oh, sick. You know, we've been using, reusing collateral to make Dosh. Fuck, we can do this at an even cheaper rate. Win-win, and then it says Nox cocaine, cocaine, which I do not uh, advocate, advocate to anyone watching this. Translation, what it, this means to a monkey, please. We don't actually know whether they're shorting these or not, but given Palafox connection to Chitadel, they own Palafox, it's a possibility. Um, edit the above is speculation the goal is to remain neutral the conclusions drawn in everything short are flawed to a point in my eyes due to this refer to the post below for more details and says thanks to another user crazy search what we do know and in the words of sir crimson king they are extending paper beyond gold i'll use his words as he put it very well in terms of what shit fuckery they've got themselves into with an accounting lens 
One piece of collateral is the basis for multiple transactions. Collateral chain, Palo Fox is carrying 16.46 billion in assets. Rather than being real assets with a minor portion invested in hedging instruments, their assets are almost entirely derivatives. So they're basically saying a substantial portion of their positions are rehypothecated. In other words, we call assets things people owe us, but we don't have. Imagine that. We call assets thin we call assets things people owe us but we don't have. That's so bad. That is so bad. That's like someone's that's like you find someone and then you somehow they own you a car but you don't have the car in the beginning. But they're going to give you the car, and that's what you see as an asset, but you never owned it in the first place. It's just such a mind fuck. It really is a mind fuck. You can't do this in a normal scenario. You can't do this in a fucking jumping center. Oh, oh I want to short that apple over there. I think the value is going to go down. Let me take it, give it to someone else, give it to someone else, give it to someone else. Or make money, blah, blah, blah. And you, oh, it's just such a mind fuck, people. It really is a mind fuck. And it says, fuck, I've seen this movie before. I'm going to click on here and see what movie they're on about. Oh, yep, the big short makes sense. How big is the problem? I believe this is the second thing uh, Mr. MB was trying to bring to our attention, which is an exposure of this problem throughout the industry, just not shit at all. Incoming collateral, outgoing, encumbered, incoming F SFTs, and rehypothecated outgoing collaterals. So you can see incoming collateral is going up, outgoing collateral is going up as well, well trading sideways really, and uh, it comes in and you can see the other two, they're way lower, but the income is higher than the outcome. Interesting. Above we have a graph that shows the income and outgoing collaterals focused on the non-dotted lines of our of the outgoing collateral, around sixty to seventy percent, around sixty-five to seventy percent of the collateral is being reused, or as we say, rehypothecated. It's also presenting, it's also representing close to two trillion dollars. Say that in your head one more time: two trillion dollars. This paper he gave us is a gold mine. My only wish is that it went further back in time. Anywho, let's dig into the rehypothecated portion of this outgoing collateral. So you've got two charts, one on the left, encumbered products, one on the right, rehypothecated products. Focus on the right side as we're mainly interested in rehypothecated products. That's a lot of fucking rehypothecated shorts, $400 billion. Repo agreements are the largest at one point at $1 trillion. What's interesting about this? Fucking feel the onion, mate. That is a subset of the first graph. Focus on treasury securities only. I nearly spat on my tea when I saw this. That motherfucking green line, high quality liquid assets. The green line essentially represents the securities coming in, backed by, you guessed it, treasury securities which are unencumbered. The tiny amount of high quality liquid assets, treasury securities, held pretty much suggests that majority of US treasury securities held are in other parts of consolidated firms. Shit Adele. I mean, you look at it, high quality assets, it's like down here. So we can say about a hundred, yeah, a hundred billion, a hundred billion high quality assets. Whereas this is at one trillion. Their collateral is at one. Oh God. One last layer of onion to peel. I swear these two observations, which are interesting and one brings flashbacks. Most of US treasury circulation done is heavily dependent on the repo market. Along with a specific line mentioned in the text of the paper, seniority of repos in bankruptcy. I'm no ape law, I'm no law ape, so I request this user chime in and help interpret this further. So until he does, take this with a grain of salt. This paper from Columbia Law School discusses whether derivatives should be privileged in bankruptcy. What is why is this interesting? Guess who's using a fuck ton of deep in the money puts to hide FTDs in GME and also has a balance sheet that has a fuck ton of derivatives. Yep, shit to Options are a category of derivative products, by the way. 
I won't speculate how this may work with Shitadel and their many branches and will await a legal aim to help flesh out this for what it's worth. Unencumbered collateral swaps is double rehypothecated swaps for treasurer securities and is growing. This is saying that our boys are using collateral swaps to upgrade their collateral through these contracts. However, whoever is engaging in collateral swaps is exchanging securities with low credit quality, thereby upgrading their collateral. Well, I've seen this movie before, once again. Who likes leverage? You might like this. So you got the daily, which is the mean, and you got the red uh, dash, which is a ninety-five percent confidence interval. Another fucking chart. Yes, last one I promise. Before we can understand what the fuck is going on here, let's understand the collateral multiplier, which is something the research is designed for analysis specifically. The collateral multiplier is pretty much a money multiplier. In the money multiplier, a percentage of the funds banks receive through deposits, liabilities, are held as reserved assets. The remaining funds are lent out in the form of loans, assets, which become new deposits in another bank, which then repeats the process. Yeah, something sounds fishy already, hey? Let's refer back to the graph. What's saying is that primary dealers, essentially market makers of treasure securities, yep, I know, create seven times as many assets backed by securities than they own. The blue line shows the lower bound and the upper bound of their samples. You have the lower bound here and the upper bound here. So yeah, this is pre so yeah, this is prevalent indicating by the confidence interval at the extreme and indicating firms create ten times as many assets backed by treasury securities with a lower bound of five. A funny parallel. Now, this is where we draw parallels with MBS. MBS were notoriously easy to sell as they were viewed as being safe. What we're seeing in the graph above and is telling us that the treasury securities are easy to monetize, hence why they're getting abused to the tune of seven times per one US treasury security. In conclusion, I believe this is what Michael Burry was trying to tell us. This is all speculation still as a result of liquidity and reserve changes in reaction to the GFC in 2008. Financial institutions have decided to abuse US Treasury securities through the means of the repo market. They are creating fragility in the financial system through collateral chains as they are creating an interconnectedness between different firms, abusing US Treasury securities to the tune of seven times per one security. A lot of assets backed by treasury securities could be fucked, speculative of course. The problem is a, the problem is huge. $800 billion rehypothecated UST repos as of September 2018. Collateral swaps are on the rise, making, shitter quality, making shittier quality assets look better than they are. The system nearly imploded. The system had a scare in late 2019, when measures implemented to protect the market post GFC essentially worked against the market. Shitadel doubled down on USTs when the Fed lowered rates in response to the COVID for the large part, but so did the entire industry. Closing remarks I've had a lot of great conversations with a range of smart apes, and the same consensus has been drawn multiple times. How the repo market is currently being used is normal. We do have an indication of the industry leveraging themselves up on UTS for repos, but we don't really have a context of if this is historically high. We also do not know if there's any fraud involved, the quality of assets being backed by UTS and so on. It's unlikely we will see market collapse unless evidence rears its head and catches both retail investors by surprise as well, as well as the Federal Reserve's through evil. Severe over leveraging, fraud, how interconnected the systems really is. Where to next? And then he goes to conclude that it's not financial advice and give him any feedback. So what do you think about all of this story regarding Michael Barry and how are basically over leveraging on US Treasury securities and how that this could basically implode? Any more information about this post in the comments, talk amongst yourselves. Let's get to the bottom of this.